Hey everyone, and welcome back to an all new episode of The Completionist, where we don't just beat the games, we complete them. Uncharted as a title, let alone as a franchise, has always been a game that I have looked at in a weird light. I didn't really enjoy the first impressions of Uncharted 1, not experiencing the game at all, but as I started completing these games, I started to fall off the franchise even more, with my favorite one being Uncharted 3, regardless of how um, unpopular of an opinion that may be. So I've been putting off Uncharted 4 A Thieves' End for many years, and now I thought to myself, you know what, let's start off 2021 with an adventurous game that'll hopefully take me to new heights. So with that said, let's begin. Here comes a new challenger! Yeah! Danger! Nathan, Elena, and Sully are back for yet another wild dive into treasure hunting and historical lore. Regardless of where you feel Uncharted 4 ranks in the series, it is simply fact that this game utilized so much of what the PS4 has to offer in order to bring us some of the most vibrant and realistic visuals ever seen on the platform. Mechanically, Uncharted 4 stays true to the first three games, but with a few adjustments. We mainly stick with Nathan in the third person, tightening up to over the shoulder as he aims with the weapon, and expanding out as he rock climbs and scales structures. New additions to the gameplay like vehicles and climbing ropes add diversity to exploration and combat, and provide some open world moments never seen before in an Uncharted game. And the cinematic feel of the game never lets go as it constantly blurs the line between gameplay and cutscene. This blurring of the line thrusts the player into the adventure and helps immerse us into the story. With the exception of a few flashback chapters, A Thief's End takes place a few years after Uncharted 3. Nate and Elena have settled into a quote-unquote normal life, with the former now employed with a salvaging company in New Orleans. It's obvious, however, that as much as he suppresses his call to adventure, it still beckons to him. One night, Nate's older brother Sam, thought to have died in a failed prison escape, comes to Nathan seeking help in finding the lost treasure of history's wealthiest pirate, Henry Avery. Since Sam's life is on the line, Nate naturally enlists the help of Victor Goddamn Sullivan and the three set off for adventure. Simple enough, obviously, but since this is an uncharted game, there's of course going to be some a to contend with. This time, it's Nate and Sam's former partner, spoiled rich kid, and Jake Gyllenhaal lookalike, Rafe Adler, who's out to make a name for himself, and he has an entire mercenary force led by the unstoppable Nadine Rose to help him do it. It's a race to Avery's treasure, which also, in typical Uncharted fashion, leans to a discovery beyond what any of them had initially expected. Okay, so so far, this is all very safe sounding like Uncharted 101. And I say that to the game's credit. People are no longer surprised when an Uncharted game leads the pack in cinematic storytelling, dynamic action, and pushing a console's graphics to the limit. In a relatively short time, it has become such an institution that people now expect these things from Uncharted. And while many people would be pleased with a dozen more Nathan Drake adventures with more lost cities and more heart racing action, the reality of the franchise is becoming painfully clear at this point point. This will be the end of the road for Nathan Drake. No more treasure hunts, no more superhuman rock climbing stamina, no more quips from the dream boat with two shoulder holsters. It's understandable that a versatile company like Naughty Dog would like to pursue other adventures, and who knows, maybe they'll change their mind, or we'll get more spin-offs like Lost Legacy down the road. But that's probably wishful thinking from the countless fans who either finally got the Indiana Jones experience they were looking for in a game, or like a lot of young gamers, grew up with Nathan Drake as their go-to video game hero. All good things must come to an end, Nathan Drake, and you will sorely be missed. end takes a grand total of zero seconds to throw you into the action of the game. Nathan's on a boat during a storm, and we don't know why or who this guy is that's helping him. All we know is that there's a lot of other boats with people who don't seem to like the fact that Nathan's there. The adventure has already begun, and I'm officially in an uncharted game. And then this happens. Nathan. What are we going to do with you? 
Now, I know these games swerve heavy on story, but this, this feels different. I've never met this big brother Sam before, but I'm already getting a strong sense of his character and his relationship with Nathan. It's pretty interesting. All right, here we go, Uncharted 4, baby. Getting some Batman McGinn vibes in this prison here. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about, and uh... Looks good. Mm-hmm. So, how was your day? What? Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm not a, uh, I think, I think I care about these people. Holy shnikes, I'm playing Uncharted and I'm, and I'm feeling something. Yeah, we're getting action and an adventure that we asked for, but we're getting something more here. With this last installment, Naughty Dog is taking a page from the first Last of Us game. It is delivering an emotional depth never before seen with the Drake clan. This grand finale blends the familiar with qualities the depths of which have never before been mined by the franchise. It's the most relatable, most grounded, and downright most human uncharted yet. Okay, so you know how Wolverine, just follow me here. You remember how when he appeared in the X-Men movie and that was cool and we got to see his claws and the next few movies he did some more cool stuff and you fought bad guys and there was that one movie we kind of all just don't talk about because it's gross. And then he did some other cool stuff, but then Logan came out, which was badass and gave us a Wolverine who was gut-wrenchingly vulnerable. Remember that? Well, this is kind of like that. Since beating the game on any difficulty unlocks a chapter slash encounter select option, I started with a low stress run through on normal difficulty with the intention of doing completion cleanup once I unlocked that option. And I'm glad that I did because this allowed me to enjoy the story mode without the interruptions of repetitive deaths or constantly referring to a collectible guide. That being said, with all the treasure, optional conversations, and journal entries required for completion, you hardly come across any of them until you're well into the game. It's as if though the game is telling the player, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that, but first, you should know who this guy is. First, take a look at this relationship right here. The characterization is prioritized from chapter one, with young Nathan, who's a very far cry from the breezy Nathan we're used to. He doesn't fit in. He holds no faith in authority to help him. Nathan is utterly alone. The only person who can turn that around is his big brother Sam, who is nothing but warm, protective, and encouraging towards his little brother. Sam is clearly Nate's role model and embodies the characteristics we've grown to love within Nate over the years. And once reunited and on the quest for Avery's treasure, the brotherly love continues. The banter is playful, the cooperative engagement is palpable, and you ultimately have two brothers who will put everything on the line for each other. It's god damn beautiful. To dive deeper into maturity, however, we reach new depths with Nate's relationship with Elena. We've seen them together since the beginning, and it's always been thrilling and dangerous and sexy and fantastical. And now they're doing their best to live a normal life, highlighted in the appropriately titled chapter, A Normal Life. This chapter has almost no action whatsoever and is actually one of my favorite parts of the game. Yeah, we've never had a locale this unexciting before, yet this prim suburban home shows so much. There's no hint that two badasses live here. The fact that all these relics from the past adventures are gathering dust in the attic suggests the couple's attempt to put aside the dangerous part of their past lives. The chapter's one moment of action comes when Nate takes a toy pistol that now resides in his trademark holster and shoots at various hanging targets, unlocking the still got a trophy of all are hit. Even with dramatic music in tow, it's a poor substitute for the action he's used to, but it's enough to show that he in fact misses that lifestyle. Exploring the house has a vibe more akin to a Telltale game than Uncharted. On my first playthrough, I was simply looking for things to interact with, but I later noticed how the walls are decorated with travel posters of distant lands, another poor substitute for actually venturing there and exploring. And then we have this moment right here. Ah. What? Where are you? I'm in here being stabbed with a fork. <laughs> oh, really? This hits home. It's an honest take at two people who clearly love each other, but are experiencing something that feels more foreign than El Dorado or Shambhala normal life. They're each trying to reconcile what they want with what they think they want, with what they think the other person wants, with what's sustainable for their relationship. And that is universal. That 
is real. It is so real that Nate gets uncomfortable and has to deflect with playing Crash Bandicoot. So when Elena discovers that Nate has been lying about his whereabouts, it is painful. Nate's exploration from Italy to Scotland to Madagascar to Libertalia is almost dwarfed by his and Elena's exploration through love, loyalty, betrayal, and forgiveness. The real treasure in Uncharted 4 were the relationships we formed along the way. A Thieves End not only gains a grounded maturity by what it adds, but also by what it leaves out. Games 1 through 3 had at least some supernatural element to them, and this game strips all of that away. Well, most of it. Look, I don't care how rich Henry Avery and his pals are, how did they make this, and this, and this, and this in the 17th century. Okay, so I have to suspend my disbelief a little bit, but this is the first time we have an uncharted story without even a hint of magic. Now, I know a lot of people may be disappointed by that fact, but after playing the game, I'm not. There was enough historical fiction and conspiracy to scratch my itch for adventure, and I agree with the developers that adding anything supernatural would undermine the humanity and realism they were steering towards. Brutal Mode is gone, which takes a huge relief off my shoulders. At no point did I feel like I was banging my head against the wall, as most failed encounters could be solved with more patience and just a lot of practice. But what I found to be Naughty Dog's ultimate step forward towards maturity was the removal of everyone's favorite obese speedrunner, Donut Drake. Yes, part of me misses him too, but any of the thought-provoking real moments during gameplay that Naughty Dog worked so hard to achieve would totally be subverted by, ha, <laughs> look at the fat guy. So with believable story, words, and realistic visuals, that only leaves one thing to get the raw human element that this game delivers on, the acting. Superb voice acting and motion tracking has been a staple for the Uncharted series, but Druckmann's script allowed the new actors to charge in with well-rounded characters of Sam, Rafe, and Nadine, while returning actors brought never-before-seen facets of Nathan, Elena, and Sully. My man, Nolan North, once again kills it as Nathan. He brings the charm, the charisma, and the unshakable humor we're used to while tapping into some subdued vulnerability. Emily Rose again shows us that Elena is a match for Nate in wit and intellect, while introducing us to how such a strong, confident woman as herself handles betrayal and the confusion that comes with it. This moment is actually one of the many optional conversations required for the Gift of Gab trophy. But to think that anyone would bypass performances like Emily Rose's in this scene is downright criminal. Newcomers Warren Cole and Laura Bailey killed it as my favorite Uncharted villains to date. But man, did I get blown away by Troy Baker as Sam Drake. Look, I was already a massive fan of Troy Baker and his work, but I was convinced beginning to end of the strong connection between Sam and Nate because of the actor's performances. Baker picks up on North's characteristics enough to make Sam a convincing older brother while peppering in enough of his own flair to show contrast as well. And the optional conversations between the two, particularly the one in Libertalia's Collapsing Tavern, are simultaneously humorous and thought-provoking and once again, real. I was not prepared for these existential moments, man. With performances like these, I strongly believe that the Academy Awards is overdue for a category in voice acting or at least mocap performance. The talent that games like A Thieves' End brings us deserves some goddamn recognition. No, 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 stop! Uncharted, what are you doing, man? I don't want this! I never asked for this! Please stop! Okay, here we go. I thought my experience with Uncharted 4 was coming to an end, but I can see it's barely begun. I feel like this is somehow my fault. Like this is some jacked up monkey's paw scenario because I remember thinking to myself, with all the climbing and such in the main story, I wish there was more combat, to which I wish I could go back in time and tell myself, shut the hell up, you dumbass. Completing these two online modes on top of the main story is a never ending nightmare. Now I realize that online multiplayer isn't new to Uncharted, but in the past, I was always saved by this. However, for us in this review, this was removed from the PlayStation 4 port, so I ended up not playing it. And dear God, thank the Lord, that the Nathan Drake collection does not come with multiplayer achievements. So here's the thing, multiplayer in itself isn't bad. 
It basically borrows the same mechanics from the main game and offers up different ways to compete with others online, like a team deathmatch or a capture the flag variant called Plunder. There's a multiplayer introduction, which yields an easy trophy, and multiplayer also has trials, which I describe as part tutorial and part challenge. Each trial has a time limit, is point-based, and focuses on a particular ability, usually rewarding extra points for using that ability. On its own, you only get a trophy in trials by completing each one on moderate difficulty. However, by completing them on hard and crushing difficulty, I was able to perform enough revives for the medic trophy and spawn enough sidekicks for the friends forever trophy before I even touched the actual multiplayer match. And then I had to play about five matches for the get in the game trophy and bada boom, bada bing, the platinum baby, multiplayer done, uncharted four done, right? Easy platinum, am I right my friends? No, I'm wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Unlockables and unlockables and unlockables. Hundreds and hundreds of skins and guns and skins for your guns and accessories and taunts and dance moves. This no longer feels like Uncharted. It's like a completely different developer approached Naughty Dog and was like, yo, can I borrow your mechanics and IP for just a sec? And Naughty Dog was like, yeah, sure, whatever. I don't give a shit. And then this happened. This is a whole different game altogether. This is goddamn Fortnite. But then there's also survival mode. Different mode, same level of unnecessary. It's comprised of 10 stages where you and up to two people team up against five waves of enemy AI. If you cannot afford a human teammate, the court will appoint an AI one for you. When you finish a stage, you earn up to three stars depending on how quickly you beat it. Survival mode was released later as free DLC and has its own separate list of trophies from multiplayer and the main game. But the unlockable skins and other garbage are tied within the multiplayer. So I guess I should be thankful for that. So for the most part, survival modes trophies aren't far from attainable. For the most part. There's a trophy for each stage you beat, easy. A trophy for earning one or more stars on each stage on crushing difficulty, tough but doable. And a trophy for getting three stars on every stage on crushing difficulty, you can burn in hell. Since that last trophy is actually labeled this, I didn't realize at first that it's supposed to be called crushing it which makes sense. I honestly thought the implication was F it, which if you ask me, makes even more sense. With both multiplayer and survival mode, your prowess isn't merely dependent on your skill, but by all the upgrades you've earned, which translates to, you can only be really good at multiplayer and survival mode if you sink a lot of time into multiplayer and survival mode. Your honor, I motion that we F that noise. Overruled? Balls. Okay, F so, I maxed out my survival mode upgrades by playing it repeatedly. I then had to find a friend to help me with the harder challenges. I had someone on our team to help me, but soon realized that despite being a decent player, he can't really do much because he doesn't have any boosts or upgrades because he hasn't squandered hours and hours on survival mode like I had. I reached out to other friends and about 30% responded that they owned the game, but less than half of those people even bothered with the online modes, and about 70% of friends responded with, Uncharted 4 has an online mode? And that is the correct response, my friends. On top of that, survival mode now has a hardcore difficulty, which is the same as crushing, but there's no respawn, so you have to complete all 10 stages in one go, or start over. There are unlockables for finishing it multiple times. So, I had to do that. And now, there's Survival Arena, which adds new types of waves to each, and, of course, their unlockables tied specifically to that. So, I guess I'm playing Survival Arena mode now. Anything else while I'm up? Can I get you anything from the fridge? No? All right, I'll just be over here in the corner crying my eyes out. Ugh, okay, 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 okay. Look, I get it. I get it. I can't really blame Naughty Dog for adding these online modes. Their combat engine is good, and why not capitalize on it? Especially since it got limited use in the main campaign. There is plenty of fun to be had here, and more is always better, right? Because even if someone doesn't like a mode or DLC, they can just ignore it and stick with what they do like, right? Well, not me. You make it, I complete it. So many hours were spent on this online grind that I wished it was a completely separate game or that it simply did not exist. Oh, and before I end this rant, I'd like to remind you all of all the positive things I said about the story and characters and how grounded and real and human everything was and how certain things were either added or stripped away from the series in order to make that happen. So, 
that only holds true when looking at the story mode on its own. If looking at Uncharted 4 as a whole, those unique aspects are undercut a thousand times by the online gameplay. The magic that was removed from the story found a home here and grew tenfold in such forms as mystical abilities and powerful pirate ghost bosses. The voice acting is still top notch, but any form of sincerity is replaced by light humor, like when Sully realizes he's taking orders from... Sully. Look, maybe I should have waited for, I don't know, uh, a Nathan Double Dog Drake collection that's bound to come out in the next few years within the PS5's life cycle, where they include a thief's end and omit online stuff and all that BS that comes with it. Maybe I should have just jumped on the game at the height of its popularity when there was less criteria and more badass players offering assistance. Maybe then I would have been the asshole who saw everything Uncharted 4 initially had to offer and asked, what else you got? But I played it just now, and I'm not that asshole and the completion criteria felt like a gross bottomless pit. Playing multiplayer matches, finishing the plethora of challenges, and fulfilling daily challenges like kill 20 enemies with his gun yields relics, which is the in-game currency used to purchase treasure chests. Opening a treasure chest earns you a few semi-random unlockables depending on the type of chest you open, and thankfully, there are no repeats of things you've already unlocked. Sounds great, but with the minuscule amount of relics you can possibly earn in a day, unlocking every single stupid thing this way would take months. Lucky for me, Naughty Dog had a quick workaround. When things take too long, it's your hard-earned money to the rescue. Go ahead and purchase some Uncharted points, which act similar to relics, except you can also buy specific packages of unlockables or, if you want, just a single desired unlockable instead of hoping it'll pop up out of a chest. And to rub salt in the wound, unlocking everything with real money to save time meant that all those relics I had earned from matches and survival stages and trials and daily challenges didn't matter as much. Yeah, they allowed me to unlock a few things for free, but it was far more efficient to spend real money and buy packages, most of which included things I had managed to unlock for free. If you remove all these transactional elements and look at the trophies alone, then survival modes crushing a trophy would still be the bane of my existence, but at least it's something that I can take some pride in. Yes, it required time to rank up, gain experience, and buff my character, but I also had to be a badass. Having a bottomless closet of clothes I'll never touch just makes me feel like I've wasted my time, and in this case, my goddamn money. Now, as you've already heard me state ad nauseum, the online multiplayer modes allows you to unlock about a thousand pieces of crap to adorn your character and make them do silly things. Cool. Getting back to the main game. Wow. Just saying those words makes me feel like I'm regaining my sanity. <laughs> Fulfilling journal entries, finding notes, engaging in optional conversations, and recovering the many hidden treasures scattered throughout A Thief's End grants the player unlock points. The bonus menu acts like a small in-game store where you can spend unlock points on various modes to change the look and feel of the game. Weapons that can be accessed at any time Nate would normally have a weapon. And yes, of course, skins. As tired as I am of customized skins, the selection here is highly contained. You can assign a skin for a character to wear throughout the game, but your choices are are limited to what that character wears at some point during the story. Yeah, it's kind of silly to see Nate climb a clock tower in a wetsuit he wore from chapter two, but seeing Rafe wear his auction house white tuxedo while barking orders in Libertalia brings a new level of douchery that I found pretty fun. Hell, let's put everyone in tuxedos. Now it's a Bond film. I consider the unlockable render modes to be simple gimmicks, so I mostly ignored them, but the unlockable gameplay modifiers were a lot of fun, especially ones like slow motion, zero gravity, and my favorite, infinite ammo. Furthermore, using them doesn't negate the ability to earn trophies, so if enabling slow mode helps you with the run the table trophy, turn that beast on. I did, and then I ran around and killed more dudes because I felt satisfyingly superhuman. Earning unlock points and trophies through finding journal entries and engaging in optional conversations was well worth it. Nate's journal entries provide some nice introspection for his character. The notes he finds enhances the lore, and the conversations have some of the best acting performances in the game. The hidden treasures I was far less excited about. I couldn't unlock everything from the bonus menu without them, and I needed all of them for the Treasure Master trophy. But there are 109 of these things. If you think I tried 
lives without a guide, you are dead wrong. And even with their little shimmer, some of them can be difficult to find because maybe the light was just skewed weird when I was looking at it. I did think that the three strange relics were a nice touch in how they paid homage to other Naughty Dog games, but for my taste, I could go for fewer treasures. Overall though, the rewards you get while completing Uncharted 4 are pretty great. Most of them are either fun or helpful for other completion criteria, or both. And as sad as I am that I can no longer unlock Donut Drake, I think I'm ready to move on from Uncharted. In my completion adventure with Uncharted 4 A Thieves End, there were 68 trophies unlocked, 56 originally being with the base game, and 12 more added for survival mode. Two-ish full playthroughs, one on normal and one on crushing. Then using previous save points, I was able to piece together for my speed run trophy. Everything else was achieved through chapter and encounter selections. 193 collectibles, that's 109 treasures, and the rest being journals, notes, and conversations. Roughly 368 deaths, not including online mode. 140 hours played, including online mode. About 1,000. Yes, 1,000 skins, taunts, and other garbage unlocked online, mostly with hard-earned cash, if I'm being honest. And three stubborn dolphins that I finally got to follow my boat. I can say with confidence that Uncharted 4 A Thieves End gave me an adventure I'll never forget. It gave me that edge of my seat feeling that I craved, I was transported with how beautiful it looks, and for a story about chasing pirate treasure, I didn't expect to relate to these characters like I did or feel such empathy towards them. And with that cinematic quality, A Thieves' End is the best movie I have played to start my year. Seriously, take my playthrough footage, slap it on Netflix or Disney+, Plus, and you've got better entertainment than most of the crap that's on those platforms nowadays. Unforgettable. What's also unforgettable is the slog fest this game put me through with its online content. Look, it's fun, it's well made, just don't try and get everything, please. Please, for me, for you, for your family, get that one skin that you love, get that one dance move that you love, and then play the game to your heart's content until you're ready to put it down. So, with that in mind, guys, I give this game my completionist rating of finish it. Finish it. <laughs>